um, so this will be the uh, event closing uh, today. Uh, today's part of the program. So the uh, discussion panel is going to be hosted by uh, five of our uh, economics graduate students. They can introduce themselves when they ask a question. They have prepared a few questions for our speakers. And then, uh, you know, some of us can join and, and ask other questions. Uh, we can have a, a free flow of discussion. So let's see how that goes, OK? So who wants to start? Uh, you want to start. Very good. So why don't you start by send, first saying your name so that everybody knows you. I am Matt, Matt Kinga. I'm a fourth year graduate student in economics. And my question is that, for Norman, I uh, believe that the importance of economic theory within the study of economics should be similar, comparable to the importance of theoretical physics within the study of physics. At the same time, he thought that a uh, long time might be needed for the theory to have major practical significance. Uh, but in recent years, I believe that there is a decline in interest in economic theory. I, my question is, what do you attribute this to? And in particular, do you think that it is partly due to a lack of belief in the importance of economic theory, the usefulness of economic theory? Do you want to go to I've heard that too. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and I were just actually talking about that. Um, when I started in economics, general equilibrium theory was a big, a big deal. Uh, and that's what you had to learn. And uh, it was essentially, you know, we knew about von Neumann emergence story. We had this book on game theory. And, uh, you know, there was some knowledge of that. And you learned about general equilibrium theory, and it's still in the textbook. It is very important. And uh, that was more years than I'd like to admit ago. And then, you know, I was lucky, this was lucky. We came along at a time, but for some reason or another, I had no idea that a bunch of young people got really interested in it. It seemed to open up a whole new set of ideas, and needless to say, as those ideas opened up, people flocked to them. And as Roger Myers in this more than once commented, uh, yeah, we were lucky, not a low hanging fruit to be picked. Uh, and that was great to be part of. And I think to stay in the textbooks. Of the class, but for a long, long time, I mean, you know, because it captures something fundamental. But it is it going to be in the same way? And the uh, thing that all of us who are uh, once in the last view, once you're in the department, always trying to figure out what's the next big thing. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> You know, any more than the company knows what the next big product is going to be. You know, we've got our guesses, we can, you know, we better certain things. But, you know, somebody's going to figure out something and say something and write something, perhaps you, perhaps some other person, and suddenly, you know, there'll be a bunch of people and, you know, theory will take off in a new way. Because what this theory do? It crystallizes you, fundamental ideas we have about how the economy works. We certainly have a lot of things we don't understand in a crystallized way. I think we'll all figure that out over time. We may have some people who try to get things to disappear. But, uh, you yeah. know. Should I say something? Sure, please. <coughs> um, I think one thing, I, first I sort of think there's a kind of predator-prey oscillation between theory and empirics. And we happen now to be on an outer loop, whereas you may have remembered that there was an inner loop. But second, I think one thing that it's hard to, even for us to remember, is how little people understood game theoretic microeconomics when Mark and I were 
small. That's what he's saying about low-hanging fruit. We totally didn't understand how to formulate teams with asymmetric information. And our teachers in graduate school, unless we're in a very special place, um, maybe Harvard Applied Math uh, with Ken Arrow or possibly Stanford with Bob Wilson, basically told us that game theory Game theory models were intractable. And at that time, game theory was owned and operated by mathematicians who focused on cooperative game theory and were basically interested in questions that were not at the center of economic theory. Um, a whole bunch of people, led by Bob Wilson and David Kreps and others, basically said, no, you want to use this stuff to think about stuff that really happens that we focus on in the rest of microeconomics, and um, we need to develop non-cooperative game theory to the point where it can do that. We had Hersani and Berkeley writing big long articles on how to define games with asymmetric information, and Herzani and Zelton um, using them to analyze simple bargaining problems. Um, basically, um, we had to do the theory first before you could even think about doing empirics. Data was harder to get. Computers were slow. You could basically run linear regression and almost nothing else. And people didn't really understand the subtle interactions between theory and experiment and empirics that they do now. Now I think it's not so much that theory is, has, has been de-emphasized, but that it's competing for the attention, and that the payoffs from combining theory with data are so high that it's very hard for pure theory to compete in the market of ideas. Um, it's not to say that there, there haven't been important pure theory ideas, but I think fundamentally the things that most excite people um, not just me, but, but uh, you know the people who just work, you know, from the top of the profession, um, are things that use state-of-the-art theory and good data together to do stuff that um, couldn't be done before. So if you look at the Clark models, for instance, it's almost all about. My name is Victor, I'm a third year. And my question is actually a follow up of Mark's question. So, and the main point of my, of my, of my question is going to be a perspective like, on our recommendations, like our basic principles, how you do a good theory, whatever that is, as far as the question, in the age where we have clearly a different situation. We started with data. Someone called it big data. And of course, that demands some change in principles, right? Like, for instance, profitability, view the simplicity, sometimes regarded for more complex analysis. Like what we saw today with the papers that we presented, okay, like the first one, uh, the Elian and Diego Libre versus the more realistic. So, I, in short, I would like to say what are somehow the, the future view regarding the new situation, somehow the new principles, if any. Um, let's take a specific example. One, one we discussed before, the Baserman and all, you know, bargaining experiments with different varieties of pre-play communication. The first thing I would do, and I haven't done this yet because I haven't had time, but for sure I'm going to do it sometime, but somebody should do it before me, is basically look closely at the data sets and see, one, whether I think there's anything weird going on that doesn't really go on that might be corrected by running experiments more carefully, maybe with higher payments for subjects. Second, to try to see what the main empirical patterns in the data are. Third, to try to see whether I can make up a theory that would allow people to use communication reliably to get outside the Meyerson and Saturday frontier and fourth, to try to find a way of modeling behavior so that I could say why face-to-face -face communication is different from 
sending abstract messages to somebody that you can't see and will never know. I think I know the answer to the last question. I think face-to-face -face communication increases line costs and therefore gives gives what we model as cheap talk more credibility than it would be if it were truly cheap talk. The other stuff, coordinating stuff that sort of goes outside of equilibrium, um, I didn't make it clear in the earlier discussion, but, but I tried to say in the earlier discussion of entry games that you shouldn't take it for granted that you can't do better than the best symmetric equilibrium. Level K thinking can do that. But also, when I looked at the data before, what I saw wasn't level K thinking, at least not in any simple way. But once you know that level K thinking can do that, you know that other kinds of non-equilibrium thinking can do that. Try to find a theoretical model um, that captures the main things, and then maybe run some new experiments, or if you're very lucky, look for some field data environment that allows you to test the theory Key point though being theory and empirics co evolve. Um, sometimes empirics need theory, sometimes the other way. Um, it's a mistake to specialize because you won't have you won't be right on top of the arbitrage opportunities when they happen. Um, and I think the profession sort of insists on empirical sophistication among even among theorists now. And I think that's a very healthy thing. I don't disagree. Um, you know, it, it's it, but just two comments to add. Um, you know, I think I think theory isn't mathematics, and you know, trying to just work with the mathematics. Um, which is fine, but you know, but it isn't going to be, you know, reproductive. So, you know, looking whether in experimental data or empirical data, what concepts try to understand, and I think that's very productive. Now, criticism of behavioral theory that I've heard and makes a lot of sense to me is, yeah, is gee, we can invent a theory for. Okay, Explain anything, but now when we see something new, do we have any insight as to which theories we should pull out of the hat? Because at some point we want some unification of the theories. And I think that's terribly, uh, you know, terribly hard, but it was a problem. Yeah. So let me add a couple more quick points. Um, don't make a fetish of closed form solutions. There's no good reason why computational solution shouldn't be acceptable, um, particularly if you need to focus on special cases of women in interest to get closed form solutions. It's not a unbiased thing to do. And it's going to die out in your generation, so you might as well kill it off now. Second, <laughs> on behavioral theory, I mean, my strategy, not just in game theory, but in behavioral decision theory applications, you try to focus on a few things which have overwhelming evidence for them. And in behavioral decision theory, that tends to mean things like a certain complex of biases and probabilistic judgment, as in first the economist's famous science paper on heuristics and biases, reference dependence and loss aversion, um, present bias and time inconsistency, certain kinds of social preferences, but not, not necessarily the simplest forms that, that FAIR became famous for, but rather more subtle beliefs-based ones, and a few other things. So you don't just try, it's not just searching for some behavioral model that can do interesting <laughs> stuff. The empirics comes first there, and that's partly a history-dependent aspect of the profession's culture. There's a burden of proof on behavioral stuff that's not equally there for mainstream stuff. Whether or not you think that's right, you have to live with that. And I'm not sure if I'm wrong. So. Yeah, I just want to add one thing to echo. Um, 
looking for closed form solutions. You know, gee, that, a lot of problems that's just going to be hopelessly hard and they probably don't exist. And, you know, our ability to think analytically, uh, who thinks analytically, and so on, hasn't evolved in the same way as the silicon has and programming languages. And, you know, you can just learn a lot. Uh, you know, it's evidence uh, that we can create that way, too, on the campus, understand these things. And, but in the short run, though, there's a lot of referees out there that don't like but there are characters who are not afraid to jump on that. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jongbin Kim, fourth year student. My application is about experimental economics. So, for the last three decades, um, experimental economics has been um, testing for economic theory and also providing um, evidence on you know, various aspects of human behavior. So I'd like to ask you um, your views on, for example, the future of experimental economy. And second, a little more specifically, um, it's your relationship with economic theory, whether um, economic theory should be more um, evidence-based one following um, previous experimental findings or vice versa. I think, I mean, I'm a big advocate of, of theory and experiment. Um, there is a kind of experimentalist who, who, who does what I privately call fishing expeditions, basically to find cool facts about behavior that aren't explained by the standard model, which is basically following in the tradition of the experimental psychology literature. Um, I think experiments are most useful for us if they're directly motivated by economic theory and they're intended to sort of bridge the gap between what theory can and cannot accomplish. Um, I believe I started getting interested in experiments because of this guy. He asked me, maybe he doesn't remember, but he asked me to write a survey of experimental results on communication for the AEA papers and proceedings long ago. And I read some stuff that I hadn't read before notably a paper by Paul Free and Rosenthal on uh, public goods for pre flight communication and a couple of other things. And I thought that those people were making progress on stuff that theorists were stuck on. In particular, it was the 80s, and the revolution had happened. Um, we knew that you could analyze game theoretic models, and the theorists started to work on multiple equilibrium, and they basically got stuck like Napoleon outside of Moscow uh, and stayed there for five years when the snow was falling and they were dying like flies, but they didn't know it. And I thought, no, this is not the way to do this. We need more evidence. And that's just one example. There's a lot of stuff that I think evidence really changes the way you think. So my own confidence in doing behavioral theory is rooted in experimental results, partly in experimental results that I sort of know are right because I did them myself with my good co-authors and students. And I sort of feel like they give you an advantage. What I said in the talk, you know, if you think that something is not an equilibrium phenomenon, 20 years ago you were stuck because there are millions of non-equilibrium models. What is that? Does that if, you, if I told you to do that, at that time you would have thought, well, you want me to stop being a theorist. Um, now we sort of have a little bit of guidance about what kinds of models to look at, and we can learn something new by looking at specific models, even if they're not perfectly established. They're a lot better than no models at all. Um, so I think, I think there has been a useful co-evolution co between theory and experiment. By the same token, I sort of think it's almost pointless to do untheoretically motivated experiments. Even the people who think that they're doing that usually have in mind some theory that they have not articulated to themselves. It's safer to make the theories explicit. Sometimes you learn that there's something wrong with them. Sometimes you refine them in a way that makes them more amenable for testing. 
testing. So I think I think we can't stop thinking about control using theory, but we ought to admit it and, and make it explicit. And I think it's essential to doing good experiments. Yeah, um, I don't stay nearly as well informed about experiments as I should, but that applies to almost everything. I wish we could stay better informed, but you now I think uh, you know, what's to a large extent, what's the basis of theory? What's it like? You know, especially in economics, about introspection. You know, can I see uh, myself actually thinking this way? How could this? How could this be? You know, and then, gee, does it show up a really experimentally? And, in some sense, rationalize it in a sensible, uh, in a sensible sort of way. Uh, it's, it's telling, it's telling a you know a well-disciplined story. Let me add something more concrete. On that. So, in Harsani and Zelton's famous book, for which the main thing that they won the Nobel Prize for, they shared it with Nash. There are a lot of what I call mental tetanomons where I imagine what Mark's thinking, and I imagine Mark's thinking what I'm thinking, and I massage those imaginings until I come to an equilibrium in my own mind about what Mark is doing and what I'm doing. That's nuts. <laughs> because we can't not only simulate other people. When we actually see real observation about what other people do, we're almost always surprised games of any complexity. Um, and I think it's nuts. I mean, you can see that it's nuts very clearly in the famous coordination experiments of Van Heik, Vitaly, and Beale that I've written a lot about, saying most notably in 95 a Convector paper called Adaptive Dynamics, the paper I mentioned. Um, at that time, they're dealing with coordination games which were symmetric. There are seven parader ranked equilibria. No political philosopher would have the slightest problem with them. Obviously, playing the best equilibrium is the best for everybody. It's an equilibrium. You know, that's the obvious answer. Um, people, people don't always do that. They systematically deviate from that. Basically, because as soon as they see hard data about how the other people are responding, they forget about mental tetanomas. And they say, look, I was thinking about what these folks would do. Look what they actually did. Let's react to that instead. And so it's sort of, so as a result of that, Harsani and Zeldin's equilibrium refinements, um, first dominance and greater dominance, immediately cease to be relevant. And we're trumped by adaptive learning. And I think that's true very generally. And it basically shows the limitations of you're theorizing in the game theory. Not to say that you can't have theory. You need theory to structure your thinking about what people are doing that's different from our son and Zell. Even You even need to know the concepts of payoff dominance or in risk dominance to know that people are deviating from them and to know how systematically they deviate from them. But, but that's not the end of the story. That's the start of the story. And in fact, both her Sonny and Selton, after the publication of the book, flipped. They had an argument about which was, should take priority. I forget who advocated which. And they say originally her Sonny said, no, no, um, Reinhardt, it should be risk dominance first, then Pareto dominance. And the other, then the other person took the other side. And then they later published articles in, in Games and Economic Behavior in which they exchanged positions. And this was supposed to be a general theory of equilibrium selection that would work on not just Nobel laureates, but on everybody. Um, so another reason why you need empirics is just that introspection doesn't do everything you want it to do. People are different, and you always learn something from watching what other people actually do. Uh, I mentioned that Maria Jose Ogarvi, I'm a PTRCN in the economics department. Uh, you guys were talking about the relationship between empirics and theory, and I'm going to generalize a little bit. And so 
it's true that in order to extend the frontiers of knowledge, we need to specialize in what we do. But sometimes that also means that some fields in economics tend to be divorced from others and don't communicate with each other. Uh, what do you feel about it? And do you feel that we should like, work on trying to communicate better between fields? Or it's just a natural thing that we tend to specialize in? Econometrics with empirics or theory with econometrics, I don't know, like different fields inside the economics. Seems to me to the extent that there occurs, there may be opportunities for people who don't do it. We bring it together. Uh, there was an imperfection in the market, if you will. <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, it's important to do experiments when you aren't sure reading this or listening to that is going to be useful. I would say, I mean, there certainly are arbitrage opportunities, and I actually think there's a little bit of a barrier to exploiting them in the sense that you know, if an article is submitted to a journal that does arbitrage across what the profession thinks are separate subfields, it's very hard to find referees who can judge those things. And so there's sort of an extra burden of proof on things that genuinely go across disciplines. That said, I think there is a sort of force for unification and the sort of empirical revolution that we're seeing now creates a demand for data that sort of makes people interested in other fields. So I see people testing game theoretic models using data from you know health economics and stuff like that, which you never would have seen when, when it was only theory. Um, now you see it because sometimes the best data is just from something from out in left field where you never expected find data before. So I would I would probably oppose having some systematic effort to force more communication across fields. I do think that, that it will happen mostly when it's productive, but, but sometimes it requires a little bit more courage on the part of authors. I guess Marco's question suggests in some sense an optimal degree of, of specialization within the profession, right? Because of the yeah. We do, we do want to have specialists because, you know, having specialists obviously allows you to, to go deeper into understanding of things, but, but at the same time you don't want these specialists to be so narrow that, you know, cannot communicate with anybody else outside, you know, his or her sphere of expertise. Uh, well, what I would say, I mean, what, should the specialization be about methods or should it be about fields with different institutional settings? Um, I, I hope for unification, you know, by people using, people specializing in methods and using the methods to cross disciplines, across subfields. Um, it seems to me more promising to find unification that way than it is to, you know, have more, more labor economists learn about health economics or something. Uh, my name is John McNeil. I'm the fifth year here at Brown. So, so far we've spoken mostly about your thoughts about the roles of, of, of experimental and theoretical and computational approaches within the field of economics. But we're joined here today by our colleagues from uh, physics, computer science, and the brain sciences. So in the spirit of unknown, I want to take this opportunity to ask you about your thoughts on the sort of cross-disciplinary role of economics with other fields. Perhaps either your experience in your career thus far, or if you're a bit more bold, uh, what areas you think might be particularly fruitful crossover research uh, in the century to come? That's an impossible question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. It, it, it's a good question. That was the same answer that Vince gave a moment ago. Sure. You know? I mean, you know, uh, mechanism design actually fits the problem of computer scientists. Perhaps better than if it's the problem of economists. <laughs> type of, uh, uh, type of uh, 
and you know, and so the specialization of techniques to going across problems uh, is, I think, you know, makes a great deal, uh, great deal of, uh, of sense. And you know, but then I would just say again, I think it's important to let yourself wander at times uh, and to see where you end up. And you know, of course, most of the time. Which is really interesting. It doesn't lead any place. So, as a follow up to that question, do we see any obvious uh, connections with, with the physical sciences that, that perhaps uh, will or should be explored? And, you know, with, like with biology, we've been connecting through evolutionary techniques in game theory, for example. Is there, is there a, a, a hope or, or a, a forecast that we can at some point see some unification with, say, physics methods or understanding chemistry? I think physics methods, I mean, you know, classical physics methods have certainly been tried a lot and are built into mainstream, mainstream and macro economics. Um, I guess I would look for for unification with natural sciences more in cognitive psychology if you're willing to count that as a natural science or neuroscience. I personally am interested in neuroscience and pay attention to it, but I also think it's quite far away from unification to the point where I would hesitate to advise a graduate student to specialize in it if he or she wanted to end up being an economist. But there's a lot of interesting facts about behavior that are bolstered by neuroscience, um, which change the way you think about which models are, are more sensible and more important in economics. So I'm, I know I must be disappointing some physicists, but I don't see I don't see a lot of useful arbitrage opportunities. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, and the philosophers have sort of beaten us up for being too much like physicists. And I, but I'm not just it wasn't me. I didn't get beat up by them, um, so I'm not reacting to that. I'm just saying that's not what I think um, the most promising direction is. Fundamentally, the problem is expectations are of vital importance in economics, and they don't seem to be of central importance in the physics, the kind of physics that I can understand. I once told my chancellor, Bob Tompkins, in San Diego, who later become president of UC, you know, what we do, it's sort of like stochastic Ising models, except the particles are forming expectations about each other. He, he, that took him aback, um, and, and, and I think the expectations are crucial. Um, so I would, I would love to see some more insights from stochastic processes, and we use those. I mean, I've spent some time studying stochastic processes myself, and physicists have good theorems about that. Things like simulated annealing do things in, that are interesting and that we can't model any other way, but I actually think most of that stuff is already in the culture, um, and it's probably a bit So I uh, can make a comment. Uh, for my mind, actually, I have a quite critical view of uh, modern agents, economic agents, by molecules in the same way. So he was quite, his criticism style was uh, very interesting. Uh, his daughter is good to more and talk about him. His criticism style was, uh, if you cannot say something good about the person, don't say anything at all. So this was his regular criticism. But there are letters in which he talked about uh, mm -hmm. the physical view is molecules bouncing into each other. And what he emphasized is the discrete mathematics component. Basically, and all the others, it's closer to computer science. 
a much more effective way of dealing with behavior, interactions, and so on, as opposed to continuous math, differential equations, and the equations. So there is a record of him contributing to the more work. So let me say let me say one thing about that. I'm I'm one of those people whose brain wraps itself around discrete math more easily, maybe because some of my ancestors are Eastern Europeans. Um, but but I also think discrete math kind of has biased game theory. When we model dynamic non-cooperative games, we model them by interacting decision trees and information flows that are all or nothing. And in reality, as we sort of saw a little bit in some of Mark's, you know, the last part of Mark's discussion, information flows are fuzzy. And we miss some things by, by treating them as zero, one variables. And I think we miss some things by imposing as much structure on game games as we have to do to make solution concepts and non-cooperative game theory work. I think games blend unstructured negotiation and other stuff in ways that's hard to model in the sort of cut and dry way that you know you would learn to do from Persani or Krebs and Wilson. So I'm not sure that, that the criticism of the kind of kind of math is completely on target. I mean, it's safe, it's safe to criticize one moment now because yeah, yeah, exactly. you can't come back and make us look like idiots. But, um, <laughs> but in this case, I don't think I completely agree with it. But, uh, you know, I just happen to be a fanatic reading uh, him. So my portray might be, might be incomplete. So basically, what you were saying is that continuous uh, mathematics is. Uh, is Calculus, and all the things that we do this, is the most, the best developed part of mathematics. It's the absolute ultimate achievement. And combinatorics and discrete math is the, the most refractory, the most difficult. We don't know how to solve it. It's very hard. We're just getting there and so on. So, uh, in some way, uh, it's a, the discrete component has an important role to play that is not as easily talked about those forms as one as we do is continuous mathematics, which is a fantasy world. We have infinite numbers there and all these things in order to explain that that is what makes uh, the tractate, the complex numbers, the real numbers, those are the best understood uh, parts of the mathematics. Okay, well, let me say two things in response to that. If you look at Meyerson and Satterquade or my version of Meyerson and Satterquade, you you get a bang-bang solution, where P of B and C is always zero or one, but there's enough smoothness so you can characterize it using, you know, using Kuhn-Tucker conditions and, you know, continuous functions, if not differentiable functions. Um, so I, again, I don't. I think you can do a lot of interesting things using a continuous idealization. It doesn't really matter that it's not literally correct. They couldn't have done what they did if they had insisted on the discrete formulation. Or they could have done it, but they would have gotten a massive, uninterpretable conditions that wouldn't have allowed them to solve the problem in their in their lifetime. Uh, second, discrete math doesn't necessarily have to. I mean, I started studying combinatorics with E. W. Tucker at Princeton, um, basically because I couldn't understand what the real analog analysis people were saying, and I could understand what Tucker was saying. And then I got interested in matching markers, which are basically like have a structure, a discrete mass structure, like the transportation problem, where even if you think of the variables as continuous, there are solutions in which you know everything is zero, one. And there's a lot of lattice structure in those models that tells you a lot more about competition in markets with heterogeneity than any continuous general equilibrium model I've ever seen. So I'm not, I don't think it's even clear that the discrete math is harder. It helps you think about things like professional labor markets or marriage markets, or as Gail and Shapley said, college admissions markets, in a way that the general equilibrium theorists in principle should have been thinking about. 
but didn't because they insisted on everything being continuous. Um, well, this good mathematics is hard. Computer science has, has been doing this for the last... Well, some of it's hard. I mean, yeah. knapsack problems are... Yeah, all this empty copy problem, all this uh, walls that were discovered, thousands of problems, a lot of them yeah. is relevant to economics or optimization, clearly come back as a, an obstacle, how do you do? So you can approximate other things. But definitely, it has a different personality. So I think what Fernando was saying, that we need to pay more attention to the discrete mathematics component of polygraph. We don't need to get that in. So the rise in the focus of the discrete I don't know if you agree, but in my experience, modern micro theorists are, are switch hitters in the sense that they can do both, and they if they can do something in a discrete setup, but they can do it in the setup, they're equally happy to do it. Do you have the, yeah. I mean, some stuff about incentives <laughs> is much easier to do that way. A large part of the incentives literature has a finite number of you know, private information realizations, often two, I mean, but, but many times you can do it with a finite number when you can't do it. But to go back again to this example, there's no way you could characterize those incentive constraints in a useful way in a discrete version of the model. And there was no way that Murley's could have done the optimal taxation stuff with a discrete version of the model. So. Okay, the is that, sir, let's also not forget that, that von Neumann was writing in 1945, but probably if he were writing today, uh, it would be the same, slightly different thing. Simply because the way the discipline has evolved uh, is, is pretty much described by what Vince is saying. The, the emphasis has been much more on the discrete aspect of the problem solving from the problem. Well, there's another thing about von Neumann in that there are two ways of generalizing the theory of zero sum conversion games. One way, the cooperative way, is what I know to Morgenstern, the path they took in the book. Um, and let me just say quickly, I met Morgenstern as a Princeton undergraduate. When I got interested in game theory, I went and said, what do I read? And, and he wrote me out a reading list. And the last thing he said to me was, don't start with my book with Johnny. And that was one, of course, no self-respecting, cheeky undergraduate would follow that advice, and I immediately went out and bought the book with Johnny again. But, but they, they took the cooperative path, which is a true generalization of the Minimax theorem in two-person zero-sum games, but which ultimately I think most economic theorists think was the wrong direction to go in. And then Wilson and a few other people took the non-cooperative path, which is also a true generalization of the Minimax theorem. Um, and I think we sort of overshot a little bit in the sense that they were wrong to take, to focus entirely on the cooperative path, but we were wrong to focus so entirely on the non-cooperative path. If you look at the introduction that Hammond wrote to Roth and Sotomayor's book on matching, you see what I think is a pretty balanced statement Namely, that each each environment contains stuff that's both that some of it's negotiated, some of it's done in the non-cooperative way. We characterize incentive constraints in the non-cooperative way because that seems like the natural thing to do. But that doesn't mean that can't coexist with a model of unstructured bargaining that's like you know Nash's cooperative solution or Nash's 53 paper. So I think we need a more balanced view not only between discrete and continuous mathematics, but in how much structure we put on the model. It's really a question of how confident you are about the institutions that govern people's interactions. If you don't really have any reason to know that a particular model is right, maybe it's better to make that part of the model unstructured and see what's true in general, and then worry about what happens if you can't get results, then you have to make, maybe take a more specific position. So that's another dimension. I believe, I mean, matching theory, of course, is the most successful example of cooperative game theory. 
Um, and the fundamental thing about matching is you can't do it by yourself. So there are trivial Nash equilibria where nobody matches because nobody else is willing to match, like in a betting game. Uh, obviously, you need a cooperative solution concept for that. Um, there could be more useful applications of cooperation, cooperative game theory, or at least partly cooperative game theory. Questions from the audience? Yeah, I would just like to tell you a little story, but this is a, 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 a somewhat trivial application of physics to economics, but it actually works. And, and uh, the two, uh, two uh, physicists from the Czech Republic happened to be traveling in Mexico, and they studied the bus system in Cuernavaca. It turned out to be a remarkable application of physics to economics. With this, these buses all are privately owned. Each bus belongs to the driver. So there's no central administration. And they actually solved the problem of waiting times far more efficiently than any of the big urban systems that we know about, simply by using local information. That each driver has a confederate who is a kid who stands at the bus stops and tells when did the last bus go? Mm -hmm. That's all the information they need. And with this, they managed to, to, to reduce the average waiting time by roughly a factor of two. And it, 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 it turns out that the theory of it is exactly described by what we call the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble of, 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 of random matrices. So it's a, it's a, it's a classical okay. is it physics problem, which is a, an accurate model for this economic system. As far as I know, this is unique as a 100% yes. successful application of physics. To <laughs> <laughs> so were the waiting times reduced because people <laughs> went home and came back later at a more appropriate time? Or no, no, the buses, buses changed. The buses came more regularly. You didn't ah. you avoid the pileup of buses, which always happens in the yeah. centralized systems. Well, in my experience, the buses pile up in the competitive systems in Mexico because they're trying to get to the passengers first. But, um, so what's the reference? Well, that's in Cuernavaca. No, Mexico City. Yes, well, probably that's not so well organized. Uh, <laughs> but do you have a rep? Is there an easy yeah, way to find Yeah, the paper was published, I think, in General of Mathematical Physics. So okay. About 10 years ago. I, I can give you the reference if I email it. I would love that. Thank you. Yes, so uh, I'm Betsy Cook, I'm a graduate student in the computer science department, um, but I also do some economics occasionally. Um, so with the rise of uh, software agents acting in our economic markets more and more, um, some of which are sophisticated and some of which are less sophisticated, um, do you see that there's going to be any sort of change to maybe the more applied data-driven economics research or, or work that needs to be done? Because it seems to me that there's an interesting thing about these agents. One, they have a sort of a different scope of information available to them, different, you know, um, but also you can uh, look at their code and know exactly what they were thinking at any given point in the decision process, right? Um, and while they're, a lot of them are proprietary now, you can imagine that like, there could be different analysis done in these situations. So what do you think that once our field starts actually being able to develop these uh, agents uh, for, for most markets, how do you think economics will respond? Um, yeah, we were first, you know, a question that we first occurred to us, are the agents actually smart? You know, you look at the code that they use, are they using it? And so, you know, then the uh, second question, what kind, kind of equilibrium does it apply? You know, is it efficient, is it inefficient, whatever? Select them on all kinds of particular set of people. Um, and uh, from the perspective, you know, sort of from my perspective, you know, an obvious question 
bastard. She. Uh, how can we organize that market so that as people construct the agents, uh, they will lead us to more efficient uh, solutions. In other words, to get good incentive compatibility there. Uh, you know, it's, it actually doesn't seem all that much different uh, to me, except for the fact that the agents presumably won't have as much noise in their decisions as human beings who will actually be able to know what they were thinking, because they can get a hold of the data, so to speak, from uh, the program. And I think you know, it's enormously promising to take these ideas of mechanism design to these systems. You said you want to amplify one of the things that Mark said. In our standard way of doing the theory, there's no difference between you making decisions in real time as a function of what you could observe and you writing an algorithm um, that does what you would like to do in real time. Behaviorally, it does make a difference, um, but I don't think we know very much about what kind of difference it makes, what, what, what deviations from the ideal you know, real time. I sort of, I sort of prefer the real time decisions as being more reflective of the actual goals of the person making them. But I don't know how the algorithm that the person would write down um, deviates from that. As a data source, I think it would be very interesting to collect the algorithms and analyze them. I've thought about that a little bit. I'm thinking about this fixed point issue that I emphasized. Um, you know, looking at the people who play, who write programs to play poker. They never do, in principle, poker is, you know, strategy, equilibrium, and a zero sum two person game. They never even think of solving fixed point problems. What they do is they go out about five or six steps in the tree, and a smarter person will go out one or two more steps, and they assign end values using some adaptive algorithm to the various end nodes of the tree, and then they optimize, assuming that those end values are correct. And I think there is some information in those algorithms, but I, but I also, I don't, I don't see any, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any theory that tells us how to map those onto the stuff that we normally think of. Yes. Maybe a later question. Because you guys are here in the computer science department, computer science is a troublemaker. So all these things are happening. In the bookstores are disappearing and all these things. So we take responsibility. Right? <laughs> the story is this. Uh, Roberto and uh, Stu also had a symposium in 2010. And Ken Arrow was here on May 7th. And on May 6th, it was the flash crash, exactly the day before. So we told him that we brought him exactly, we planned it, because that's the world. But we asked him how it is possible that, you know, the market could be so unstable. You know, can it crash despite of all this, maybe there are limits of what we can analyze about interacting with the computer system? People don't foresee interactions. People don't have good intuitions about what we used to call general equilibrium interactions. They tend to assume that the model is simpler than it is, that things are constant that are really not. And if we knew more about what the typical assumptions were, we might be able to have better assumptions about how fragile particular systems were. It tends to because technology is the most unpredictable. Somewhere. So what's happened there, from what we understand, is that two different programs created by two different groups were supposed to interact together, and all of a sudden, some major failure happened. So what is the power of you know, interactions yeah. between programs? Can we you know, model behavior of this kind of Well, it can be that you know you write a program, I write a program, and they have they have built-in features that present them that prevent them from being yes. equilibrium in equilibrium. And something's got to change, and that change might take the form of an explosion. Yeah. Um, can everything fall apart? Can we have a 
10,000 crashes. Hey, it must be that we could write a set of programs that would back everything forward. Yeah. But also, that would we, be my guess. but also we would step out of the programs when things got. No, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even with the best intention, could there be such characteristic flaws in the trading that one day we see? Yeah, you know, it's what you yeah. said a minute ago about the expectations. Yeah. Those programs have expectations built into them. We have, in some sense, contradictory expectations or something. It's very interesting. Yeah. And the programs. May not be very good at backing off. Let me flip sure. Let me flip it, and I think it'll make the answer more evident. Imagine you're trying to design a system where the probability of a crash is zero, no matter what the input. I bet that that's impossible. Um, and I mean, maybe there's an impossibility there, right there which I will leave it to you to prove, to formulate and prove. But, but, I mean, you have to have realistic limits on what the interacting components know and when they know it and how fast they can act. So maybe there's not a clean theorem there, but it's not at all obvious to me that you can reduce the probability to zero. Cool. There are massive codes that evolve over years. Who knows what they mean? Well, you know, the folks that do high speed trading by definition is too complicated because of the speed. And, uh, and you know, and that means, that in a sense means they're dangerous. So, what do you mean by too complicated? That's, that's I, uh, in the sense of they can't have too many branches and, okay. and, and so on. You know, they, the there's the people who write those codes, uh, you know, to have sort of maxims, you know, don't read from this kind of memory, it's going to take you too long, and, okay. uh, things like that. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I, you know, I've never looked at those codes and so on, but, it, but speed isn't the essence of some of these places. I think, I mean, to partly contradict what Mark said, I mean, I think sometimes amazing what well-designed interactive systems made up entirely of simple components can do. And my favorite example of that is in a book by my San Diego colleague Edwin Hutchins called Cognition in the Wild. Hutchins is an anthropologist by trade. He doesn't like to camp out. He likes to shower every night. He likes good food cooked by other people. So he got the idea of studying the US Navy <laughs> which he was in before. So they let him study the quartermasters who were in the U.S. Navy or the people who steer the ship. And basically it's like 15 enlisted men, none of whom has any more than a high school education and some less. And they're each instructed to do something very simple. And there are double checks and fail-safe things that automatically are built into the system. So even though each one never has to do anything more complicated than write a number down, pass it to somebody else, and maybe look at somebody else's number and see if it looks too high, um, the system collectively perfectly navigates the ship. Um, so I think, and it's different if you have to do things in sequence in real time, but I think somehow the, the sequence of simply executed instructions can have more intelligence than each of its parts or than the sum of its parts. So I simply don't disagree uh, uh, with what you said. That system was set up by, in a sense, cooperatively. Okay, so these computer systems to set up Okay. Many a, extraordinarily non -cross. So you're saying it's like a ship with two different kinds of sailors, and some of them are trying to crash the ship. No, they're just trying to get the ship where they want it to go, but it's two different places, and they get in between in the middle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So no, that's a good that's a good criticism. Uh, I thought your criticism was just fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, thank all our panelists. Thank you. <laughs>